looking at today, the culmination of the first year, and we talked about at the very beginning in Nature One, we talked about how nature has a movement. While nature is not objective at all, nature is not objective. It's naive to think that there's a there there. The more one exactly looks at what's there, the more it recedes and is only a dynamic gestalt. And one can push that analytical methodology to an ultimate to where you can see nature disappears. The traditional name in Western wisdom was divine darkness. And it's graphically like when you look at the night sky and you look at all the stars, if you stop looking at the stars and you look at the space in between the stars, if one could look exactly, one would find that there are stars out of sight. There are whole galactic structures in those spaces, but just the same, there is a point at which one penetrates through and the vast volume of nature is space. A space so large that it seems dark to us. That's the divine darkness. Why is the night sky black? Because immense reality in nature seems dark. Why does it seem dark? Because these eyes, these, this appendage, and this appendage, this pair of eyes, are adjusted to the electromagnetic spectrum. And they see only a narrow energy band called visual light. The actual fact is, is that the universe is a burst of super light, but it's in the magnetoelectric spectrum, not in the electromagnetic spectrum. And the magnetoelectric spectrum at about 10 billion times the frequency. That is, you take the highest frequency in the electromagnetic spectrum and jump that 10 billion times. And that's where you get uh, super light. The celestial realm. So that the truth is, is that reality is so bright that we only see it as dark. These eyes cannot see light that vast, that pure, that intense. And so it records in us as darkness. So that the ultimate truth that one would come to, if one could push analytically to the ultimate, one would come to understand that one sees, in fact, darkness. And one should know that, that that's what one sees. And then there's a transformation. There's a change. Jung called it, and using the Heraclitian term from ancient uh, pre-Socratic Greece, in antiodromia, a complete reversal, a complete transverse. It's like the principle of yin and yang. When something becomes 100% yin, it becomes immediately yang. When something becomes completely what it is, it changes to its opposite. This is the nature of polarity. All polarized energy is like that. If something becomes so incredibly positive, that's a negative. This is the law of the universe. This is what's called dharma, not karma. <laughs> karma gives you digestion or indigestion. <laughs> Dharma gives you you. <laughs> you get the difference? <laughs> Dharma is that polarities, in order to be real, must be mutually exclusive to the point that when one completely dominates, then the other instantly becomes manifest. That's the law of polarity. And because the law of polarity is provable, these electric lights would not work unless electromagnetic energy could be polarized. And it can be polarized. 
when electromagnetic energy, the whole spectrum, is raised to its completeness, it winks out and goes into the opposite polarity, which is the magnetoelectric spectrum. Simply put, man's extremity is God's opportunity. When we come to the end of us, that's the beginning of the divine. So the whole purpose of a traditional wisdom education was to gently bring you around so that you could see there are no cards up the sleeve. In fact, there's no cards. There are no deck. There's no game. There's no dealer. There's nothing happening whatsoever. That clears out, it demagnetizes all of the expectations, all of the projections, all of the suppositions, all of the neediness. What one is left with in nature is complete zero. Complete zero, or divine darkness, as they used to say. So our education began with looking at nature in such a way that we could follow the whole course of integration to today. And today we will find an example, interval four, the cloud of unknowing. The cloud of unknowing. I use the Penguin Classics translation because I've used it for about 25 years. But there is a very good translation with far out cover here from the, <laughs> from the classics of Western spirituality. Now, the author of The Cloud of Unknowing is, is unknown, appropriately, but uh, was so famous, and uh, The Cloud of Unknowing has sold so many copies that the classics of Western spirituality put out the other works under the title of The Pursuit of Wisdom. And on the cover of this one, it's a little more traditional in terms of ancient uh, worship. This position is called the Arans, and this was the original prayer position. This was the prayer position 4,500 years ago uh, in the highlands of northern Iran, where the Magi would uh, uh, expose themselves to the reality of the universe, to the nothingness which is there. Uh, this uh, worshiper here is a Hellenistic uh, Jew, and uh, Appropriately so, because uh, that was the end of that particular aeon, and all of the archetypal images came back exactly to where they should be. Just as in our time, they're all back exactly where they should be. And uh, where are they? They're exactly at zero. So anyone who's teaching something other than that is either lying or making something up. Because the absolute truth is that right now, zero obtains. It has to obtain. It has to hold. Because without that, there's no way that you can root a cardinal linearity in this universe. It has to have some place, a foundation, upon which one can happen. And one happens against the denominator of zero. It has to be that way. And when it is that way, then the zero changes into one. It's a simple mathematical truth. You can teach it to first graders. You can write one as one over one. But when you write one over one as one, with a numerator and a denominator, the same, with that equanimity, that equanimity is the exact polar opposite of zero. And because they're 180 degrees, one has the whole circle of cardinal linearity possible. Then two can happen. But two doesn't happen mystically because it follows one. Two happens because one and zero together are two. And like that. So that there's a kind of an optical illusion which is carried over because the senses always carry over to the initial brain. The brain is sensual and so it carries over. 
and that illusion carries over into the brain. And it takes a conversion. It's called today in mathematical physics a renormalization. The mind has to renormalize the brain in order to discern the real. Now, once upon a time when we didn't make a distinction between brain and mind, when the Bhagavad Gita was written, the phrase was, the mind is the slayer of the real. But that term, manas, uh, referred to uh, the brain. The brain is the slayer of the real. What this means for us is that the cloud of unknowing is going to teach us, in a way, about divine darkness and we're not using it as a Christian meditational text. We're not using it as a literary example of 14th century Middle English high wisdom. We're not going in for that at all. We're not interested in literature, qua literature, or theology, qua theology, or anything else. We're interested in our integration, which started in nature and went through ritual and through myth and symbol, coming to the only real resolution that integration can come to. Real integration always comes to the ground upon which the dynamic movement of the cardinality was based and founded. One always comes to the context in which it has occurred. When you have thought Every thought that there is to think, there's one more thought to have. That thought is not a thought about any of the contents of thought, but the thought about thought itself. As Shelley will say in Prometheus Unbound, to hope till hope itself creates from its own wreck the thing it contemplates. The fact is, we must dissolve out of this life in order to have life eternal. That's the simple truth. As long as we stay in this life, we're in a condition temporizing. We don't belong there. We belong in the real. And that's why we die. That's why we get sick. That's why this body frays. That's why time frays. That's why whole bubbles of universes fray. They're made to fray. They need to fray. They need to go through their cycle. The cloud of unknowing, then, is the fourth interval. It's the final lecture in this whole series of integration. Now, I'm going to give you some insight to cut through and make it very simple. When we come to the other works of the author of The Cloud of Unknowing, The Pursuit of Wisdom. And we come to the introduction. The translator says to us that almost all of the deep wisdom of the anonymous author of The Cloud of Unknowing is founded upon a mystical writer who lived about 500 A.D., the cloud of no, unknowing being somewhere in Chaucer's time, somewhere around uh, 1370, something like that. So we can just make the classical author, whose name was Dionysius the Areopagite. He was also anonymous. That was just a name that he took. So the anonymous writer can be placed in uh, 470 and the cloud of unknowing in 1370. So there are 900 years in between them. 900 years. And in those 900 years, in that enormous time span, there was only one mind that understood the poignancy of the thought of divine darkness. Only one, if you can imagine. And his name was uh, Eriugena, John Scotus Eriugena. He was the one who made the intellectual bankroll for Charlemagne, so that that could be uh, what we call Europe today. 
Europe is a uh, is a uh, final phase form of a Carolingian Renaissance, authored by one man. He made it all. He made it all because he could read Greek well enough to understand the writings of Dionysius the Areopagite, and he also honed his spirit enough so that he could understand the spontaneous symbolic consonants of what he had uh, learned. The next person to be able to do this was the author of The Cloud of Unknowing. Now, there were many geniuses, and there were many people that uh, were great achievers, but there was no one before this that really got it to the nth degree, as we used to say. Nth meaning an exponential quality of unlimited intelligence. Unlimited intelligence. We think an IQ of 150 is huge. Or Somebody once computed that Goethe's IQ was 200. You know, that's enormous. And we're all familiar with science fiction stories where the robots are colossal superintelligence or they're mutants and so forth. At a certain point of penetration, the mind becomes of infinite IQ. And this is the point that's made in the shortest of all of the writings of Dionysius the Areopagite. It's called The Mystical Theology, and it's translated in this uh, volume, uh, this volume here, the works of Pseudo-Dionysius, the complete works. They use the medieval scholastic term pseudo, meaning false. False Dionysius. False because it wasn't his real name. We don't know who he is. Well, it comes across in medieval scholastic language as if this was like false, false person. Not at all. The term Dionysius the Areopagite is taken from the letters of Paul in the New Testament. Paul, in one of his letters, talks about how he was in a very large Greek city and he was in the Areopagi, Areopagus, the uh, great public uh, uh, square of uh, Mars, Ares, and heard the pristine wisdom which he took to be a direct transmission from Jesus. He heard it exactly. Who the speaker was, no one knew, but the speaker um, was called Dionysius, the Areopagite. Now, it's very esoteric, and it's lost usually in, in the Western tradition. The surface uh, passing of this uh, was lost a long time ago. The last person to have ever understood this would have been someone like Proclus, and he died about 530 uh, AD. In ancient Greek wisdom, there was a diamond, and that diamond was the total gestalt of all understanding. But it was not a regular diamond. It was what we would call today a Herkimer diamond. It had a double focus. A Herkimer diamond has uh, uh, equal facets coming to two points. They're like spindles. Uh, they're only found... Uh, in certain ancient volcanoes, and uh, the best ancient volcano in the world that has them is in Upper New York State, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the, the area is owned by the Seneca Indians, and uh, they have kept it holy for 10,000 years at least. Those Herkimer diamonds do not need to be cut they do not need to be polished or cut. They come out of nature completely whole. You just pick them out of that old, ancient, archaic, geologic clay, volcanic clay strata, and they come out whole. So they're, they're much better than mushrooms. As, as a complete, pristine understanding instantaneously that 
nature occurs also in ultimate perfection without having anything else to be done to it. The ancient Greek wisdom was like that Herkimer diamond. One of the focuses where all the facets come together was expressed by the mythological god Apollo. Apollo. But the other facet, polar to that, was expressed by the Greek mythological god Dionysus. So that Apollo and Dionysus, the Apollonian and the Dionysian, together, constitute a pair of polarities that encompass the entirety of the gestalt of ancient Greek language wisdom. So Dionysius the Areopagite is the one who spoke at the negative, at the dark end. Not the darkness of Darth Vader, but the divine zero end. So that Apollo represents the sun, the light of this world. And Dionysius represents the space of the moonless, sunless night. So it's this kind of quality. So Dionysius, the Areopagite in 500 AD, taking his name from this figure. Paul would have heard Dionysius, the Areopagite, the original one, somewhere around um, 55 AD, 55 CE. Why would this man take this, this name, this anonymous name? Because he understood the ways in which doctrinaire minds work. His writings were preserved because of the psychological associations with St. Paul. Otherwise, his works would have been thrown out because all the other works in the wisdom traditions were all, if they were not thrown out, that's maybe a little strong, they were put on shelves and simply left there. Nobody talked about it. Nobody discussed it. Between the time that uh, Plotinus's doctor and, uh, and number one student uh, uh, published his Aeneids in about uh, 300 AD, until the translation of Ficino in 1492. There never was in 1,200 years anybody who ever read Plotinus, if you can imagine. So there are a lot of times when whole millennia go by and nobody knows anything. It's one of the real sobering facets of teaching wisdom. That ignorance is so mud thick, so obstinately, projectively stupid, that you can have a thousand years of nobody knowing the high wisdom. And it's not so hard to come by. One learns to respect the absolute pristine jewel-like quality then of a spirit that can bring wisdom back exactly in its reality. Dionysius the Areopagite brought that Plotinian focus of wisdom, but he put it into a fictive character called Dionysius the Areopagite, who was always associated with St. Paul, and nobody in church doctrine, because it's all founded on the letters of St. Paul, is going to throw it out. And so it survived. When we come to the translator's introduction here, to the other writings of the Cloud of Unknowing, we see here that the translator uh, edited and translated and annotated by James A. Walsh, S.J. What does S.J. mean? It means a Jesuit. S.J. means soldier of Jesus. The Jesuits were an order that were made. It's almost like Isaac Asimov's foundation series. The Jesuits are the foundation order to make sure that they understood all thought there could be any competition to church doctrine wherever it comes out. So they educated themselves. The Jesuits are the ones who went to China and brought the I Ching back in the 17th century. But again, there's usually just one person that can understand things, and so the only person to understand its real implications was Leibniz. And he wrote a little treatise on it, and it laid in dusty shelves and 
uh, one of the little royal miniature royal libraries in Germany for about 300 years before it was finally translated. It was published by the University of Hawaii just a, about 10 years ago. It's called A Dissertation on the Natural Theology of the Chinese. 17th century commentary on the I Ching by Leibniz, the man who founded our notation for calculus. In fact, all of calculus is based upon understanding the yin-yang of the I Ching. Because without the understanding that integral and differential always go together in the real, one would never have any idea of how to solve the approach of zero and the approach of one of infinitesimal phasings. That's what it's all about. In between zero and one is an infinitesimal infinity. And one has to learn to deal with that in order to have perfection of realization. Perfection. And we, miraculously, are capable of perfection, of realization. Not because we study for 50 years under great teachers in fantastic universities, but because we are the absolute reality, we're the bud of billions of years of sophisticated evolution and we have it in our bones, so to say. Only we have to activate the entirety of ourselves in order for it to blink into truth. So this translator, this wonderful Jesuit, James A. Walsh, who's done his own translation um, here, he writes, apart from the Gospels and some of the Pauline epistles, there is no single short work in the whole body of Western religious literature that has had so profound a theological influence and so extraordinary a spiritual impact as the anonymous mystical theology. Within our own theological and spiritual time span, the works of the Areopagite have commanded the veneration of the greatest of the scholastic theologians and won them as commentators. We have already had occasion to glance at the father of them all, John Scotus Eugena. And then he goes on from there. When we turn to the mystical theology of Dionysius the Areopagite, which is the foundation for the cloud of unknowing, we see that it begins on page 135 and ends on page 141. When uh, Aldous Huxley was making money available uh, in the 1930s to publish classics of world literature, it was so short. They put them all out. They put about uh, a dozen world classics in spirituality out with nice little uh, blue covers, the color of bluebells, a beautiful spiritual blue with gold stamping and a special symbol that uh, uh, the, the Huxley clan designed together with the uh, Isis uh, uh, symbol and all other things, and they called this the uh, publication series, The Shrine of Wisdom. But the mystical theology was so tiny that it was dwarfed you know, by the hardcover boards that came out. And even though all the other things were thin, this was ridiculous. So they included another one of his works. <laughs> they, they included the uh, celestial uh, um, uh, hierarchy. And then when they when they found that they had done the mystical theology and the celestial hierarchy, and there's only one other work by him, they put a second volume out of the third work, The Divine Names. So all of his works got published by uh, in a little place called uh, Goldemain down in Surrey. A little tiny ancient uh, thatched cottage. The mystical theology is six pages. It's in five chapters. Notice again the reoccurring five. Sir Gwain's star is five points. The energy cycle of Taoism is five phase. We have five digits. Why is five so important here? Because when five is paired, you have ten, and ten as a base is a universal energy manifester. You can 
measure energy. You can measure movement in calculus to an infinite, infinitesimal accuracy because the powers of 10 always hold. Always hold. And so the non-polarized exponential base upon which the infinite, infinitesimal accuracy of manifestation holds is the human hand. That's why it's the symbol. It was a symbol 40,000 years ago. In Lascaux, when all the animals that life depends upon are put there, the last thing that's put there is the handprint. You don't have to have a portrait of the person, just the human hand. It seals everything and makes it real. And it's not the kind of magic that is decadent, that becomes metaphysical mumbo-jumbo. It's the kind of magic upon which science is founded. Because science occurs because magic is developable. But it's developable not in integration, but in differentiation. Science is a ultimate differential magic. Whereas black magic tries to be integrating and make more powers for whoever uses it. And that's why it's black. Because it's stupid. The mystical theology has five chapters. The first chapter has this written under it, translated out of the Greek. What is the divine darkness? Right away. What is the divine darkness? Chapter two, when you look at it, underneath it in translation, how should one be united to the cause of all things which is beyond things? Chapter 3, in translation, what are the affirmative theologies and what are the negative? Integral, differential. Yes? No? Yin-yang. Chapter 4 has this written under it. Notice how completely basic, essential the mystical theology is. What is the divine darkness? How do we unite with that? What's the difference between affirmative and negative theologies? Chapter 4, that the supreme cause of every perceptible thing is not itself perceptible. In order for there to be form, any kind of a form, there must be a background which is not a form that allows for form to be seen. It's one of the first things you learn in aesthetics. There has to be an awareness that contexting every form is a background which is unformed. It has to be. That's the whole way in which yin and yang work. That's the whole way. Well, what would chapter 5 be? And these chapters are one paragraph each. Chapter 5 is that the supreme cause of every conceptual thing is not itself conceptual. Chapter 4 and Chapter 5 are like this auguring of wisdom. Divine darkness. How do we unite with that? What's the difference between affirmative and negative theologies? That perceptibleness does not extend to the base of perception. That conceptualness does not extend to the base of conception. That's the whole thing. That's it. That's, that's it. Finito. Nothing else. That's the foundation upon which all Christian thought rests. Now we run into a problem. We run into a problem with this because when we talk about when we talk about this and how are we going to talk about this? We're going to go to a translation of one of the letters of quote Dionysius the Areopagite that survived. 
few of his letters survive. In one of his letters, the man, 1,500 years ago, says exactly what we'd never hear. The truth about the religious structure known as a church, any church actually, this is the whole Christian church. But let us not suppose that the outward face of these contrived symbols exist for its own sake. Rather, it is the protective garb of the understanding of what is ineffable and invisible to the common multitude. This is so in order that the most sacred things are not easily handled by the profane, but are revealed instead to the real lovers of holiness. Only these latter know how to pack away the workings of childish imagination regarding the sacred symbols. They alone have the simplicity of mind and the receptive contemplative power to cross over to the simple, marvelous, transcendent truth of the symbols. But there is a further point to understand. Theological tradition has a dual aspect the ineffable and mysterious on the one hand, the open and more evident on the other. The one resorts to symbolism and involves initiation. The other is philosophic and employs the method of demonstration. Further, the inexpressible is bound up with what can be articulated. So you have two. You have something that cannot be articulated and something that can be. And the two of them are bound together. How are they bound together? They are not bound together by any subtle doctrine whatsoever. They are bound together by the universal laws of polarity that in angiodromia is the only way in which this pair maintains their reality. Were they not bound I have to use the term dharmically. It's kind of a made-up word. If they were not bound in this way, their mutual exclusivity would make an unreality manifest. It's not that that's impossible. It's deeper than that. There's no way to say it. It's deeper than impossible. He writes, The one uses persuasion and imposes the truthfulness of what is asserted. The other acts and by means of a mystery which cannot be taught, it puts souls firmly in the presence of God. And you can hear that they're coming for me. <laughs> because no one's supposed to talk about this. When Ficino finished in 1492 translating Plotinus, you can understand it was an epical year. Was this Columbus discovered America, you know that. You don't realize, but the Muslims were driven out of Spain in 1492, El Cid. Uh, Ficino translated Plotinus and also Dionysius the Areopagite. His translation of Dionysius the Areopagite had an immediate f effect in England, in London. Why? Because the largest church in London is called St. Paul's. <laughs> it's, it dominates, and believe me, in the 1490s, St. Paul's dominated London more than anything. The Dean of St. Paul's was a man named John Collett, C-O-L-E-T. John Collett was one of the wealthiest of all Englishmen, and he put his entire fortune to the service of education. And as the Dean of St. Paul's, he was the most profound speaker in England. He had studied with Ficino. He was the great pal of 
Sir Thomas More in his youth, he was the great pal of Erasmus. Collet being the dean of St. Paul's and Dionysius the Areopagite being always associated with St. Paul, made an enormous commentary in four volumes centering on the writings of Dionysius the Areopagite in Latin, because that was the language of the day, of that kind of discourse. But it made London, by the early 1500s, the center of commentarial understanding of a wisdom that had been not looked at for a long time. The essential quality of that wisdom is that the church teachings of imposed logical order were only one half at most of what was real. The other half being the innate symbolic realization capacity of the human soul. And the whole English Reformation, the whole phenomenon of Henry VIII, the whole thing of Thomas More's utopia, the whole development that led to Shakespeare, the whole development of leading the English to pioneer the new world in a way in which the United States happened. All of that came. All of that are further ramifications and functions of the fact that Dionysius the Areopagite was translated into a language that was accessible to the deep mentality of people like John Cohen and that they were able to do commentarial work and an enormous change happened. The Renaissance became the Reformation in exactly this way. Now there's esoteric aspects uh, involved too. They involved alchemy. Because the way in which in antiodromia yin yang transforming the way in which transformation happens was always given an alchemical profile it was always talked about in terms of alchemy but the ultimate alchemy was not to make gold but to make the jesus within your soul Because when everything that you were in a worldly sense was boiled away so that there was nothing left of you whatsoever, there was still mysteriously that reality was there. What reality is that? The presence of God. Called in the Christian tradition um, the, the Christ. The presence of God. So that the whole import of the cloud of unknowing which is founded on this, almost like a Upanishad. It takes something that was still hidden in its own time. There wasn't anybody who understood this. And so that's why the author was anonymous. But he lived in a great age of the English language, in Chaucer's age. I don't know if you understand or not, but a great artist makes the language. And before Shakespeare, the greatest maker of the English language was Chaucer, Chaucer's English. While Shakespeare's language makes dynamic gestalts that lend wings to the spirit, Chaucer's medieval English made language that allowed for the individuality of human character to be seen. Because before Chaucer, the English language was not fine enough to make exact portraits Chaucer's English made that language available so that one could make Rembrandt-like sketches of character. And that's why the author of The Cloud of Unknowing at the same time was able to show that the ultimate portrait of us all is in that presence of God in our souls when all the other sketches are put aside. And we think that there's only a blank sheet there. Then we see, mysteriously, the face of God is on that blank sheet, so called. In Antiodromia, a complete transformation. So that's what this was all about. You have to code it, though, 
just like Dionysius the Areopagite in 500 AD, had to coat and take a name. The author of The Cloud of Unknowing put his little pill coats on this and made this a nice, pleasant English parson's advice. So, we turned at random to page 73. What does he say in his nice little Middle English, Middle English, Mid-England? You can't get more mid than that. <laughs> a middle-aged, Mid-English, Middle English speaking Parson, he says, therefore the vigorous workings of your imagination, which is always so active when you set yourself to this blind contemplation, must as often be suppressed. Unless you suppress it, it will suppress you. Now if you have 25,000 hours of analysis, you realize that this guy knows a lot. <laughs> Let's take a break. This is the frontispiece to alchemical studies. And I have uh, listed here the five different chapters, the five different books, the five texts that comprise this volume. So take it upon yourselves uh, to put your name under one of those five, and we'll get our, our groups underway. The whole important quality here is not to be exhaustive in terms of ideas. No one can do that. That's an unrealistic expectation. This is very difficult material. What is important here is the old phrase exposure, to bring someone in to contact, to come in contact with. One of the great qualities of uh, education used to be, uh, they used to say, coming in contact with great minds. Uh, actually, it's coming in contact with, uh, with persons, character, who, uh, who have developed it. Pan in a little bit with the camera. As the camera comes in, the camera becomes more selective. Pan in a little bit more. And finally, as the selection limits the options for the spread, the, each detail gains in weight. Pan in a little bit more. So that at very close quarters, if one can overlook the obvious blemishes of, uh, you know, disastrous character and uh, aging and, and things, one, one finds uh, underneath the uh, saboteur a, a, a person, a character. This, and then pull back a little bit. This educational technique of the second year, there, it's fine, concerns a different process entirely from the first year. The process of the first year was, as we could say, something which was uh, clockwise. It was natural. It was a natural movement. It was the movement of integration. It's a principle of nature. It's like gravitation. The manifest electromagnetic universe likes to come together. Atoms like to join together. Molecules like to join together. Birds of a feather. All of this quality. It's all integral. Nowhere in that cycle does a person exist. It's not that we don't exist, but it's that our personality is a, an objective gestalt, which is in a different mode of energy. It's in the differential mode. 
So if one wishes to develop one's character, you have to differentiate. The integral process is not going to do it. Now we found that occasionally the 50-page outline of the entire course is useful to refer to. And because we're entering into the second year in a couple of weeks, the very first part of the second year, the very first movement in differentiation is vision. Vision. And under vision as consciousness, in your little booklet, pages 22 through 24, talk about vision as consciousness and focus upon Jung's alchemical studies. Not that the whole differentiation is based on Jung, not at all. I consider most of Jung out of date. I'm teaching uh, 50 or 60 years after his best work, three generations. And I'm talking about the next two or three generations. But he is trustworthy in these aspects to give us a founding upon some of the issues. Here's what it reads, if you would, uh, at some time on your own, go to page 23, near the bottom. The last paragraph contains a few sentences like this. Nature is a first world. Culture, a second world. Ritual and myth together. The self on the symbolic horizon is a third world. The person will be a fourth. Now a lot of the metaphorical context of this is like Book of Hopi language, the fourth world. The place where one is brought out finally into the present. In one of Jung's most per perspicacious observations in the spiritual problem of modern man, in the book Modern Man in Search of a Soul, he says, the problem with modern man is that he's not here. You almost never meet somebody who is here. You meet people who are living in the past or people who are living in the future. They're living elsewhere than here. That now, and it doesn't have to be particularly Zen, it doesn't have to be particularly finger-snapping hip, it means simply that the present moment is so fleeting. How fleeting? Fleeting to the extent that it has no objectivity when analyzed through completely. So that if one were going to give a symbol for the present one of the best symbols that one could give is just a little arrow. And in calculus notation, the arrow is used. One of the most convoluted of modern thinkers, Martin Heidegger, using the German term Dasein, being there. The objectivity of the present is an illusion. And this is why when one would like to be certain, one slides into the past or occasionally into the future. Because one can maintain the illusion of certainty more easily there. Whereas the present, that present moment, it's an existential quandary. One of Kierkegaard's most poignant resolutions in Purify Your Heart is to think of one thing only. Purity of heart is in thinking of one thing only, the present moment. Yourself as here. Jung says the problem with, spiritual problem with modern man is that no one is here. You can walk around forever hoping to meet someone. All of this is not because of ignorance or just bad habits or slovenliness. But we've seen in our whole first year of education, 
that this occurs because it's in keeping with the way in which nature happens. Nature is not statically there, ever. It's always a matrix of change. It's always a dynamic process. It's always a happening. It's always occurring. One has to use gerunds and all of the, the verbs coming and going. But the form of that natural ecology, the overall energy mode, is to achieve integration, coming together. And that the highest condensation of coming together are symbols. The Greek term symbola means thrown together. Like a chef who cracks the eggs and puts in the spices and the herbs and the olive oil and the various things. And there you have it. The Buddhist Abhidhamma also understands that there's nothing real there. There's only this dynamic Gestalt, which occurs. There's nothing there. Anatta, no self. But it's just a metaphorical slip of the tongue to go from anatta to anahata, from no self to heart, heart chakra. And just like the Manipura chakra is always symbolized by fire, believe it or not, fire in the belly. It's a very old phrase. <coughs> but that fire creates a quality so that the next chakra has the light and the heat, the heart. Now you can see if we follow language, if we just follow language, we can go off on skews. We can talk about and get ourselves carried away. The whole purpose of a mind, that renormalization function, is to bring back the present awareness of what is happening. What, is, what are we doing? And we called it, six months ago, when we inspected that and looked at that, we called it the doing of what we do. What we do do. That bare attention, that mindfulness, that satipatthana, that quality. And out of that quality of our pragmatas, of our action, of our doing, comes another world related to nature, but related selectively, the world of culture. But there's nowhere in nature or in culture that the person has existential objectiveness. The whole purpose of a culture is not to realize a person but to keep the community, to keep the tribe, to keep the tradition, to keep the selective cycle and ecology healthy, pure, more or less. So that when we get to the interiorization of experience through language, so that experience interiorizes into the mind, it's not surprising then that at the ultimate focus of the mind, there is no object. As long as one carries images of the divine, there is no divine presence. Nietzsche, once observing, is, uh, he's very often quoted, when the half gods go, then God comes. No graven images. No names. And one doesn't have to understand a theological term like apokatastasis. One only comes to 
observe in the interiorization of one's own experience that there's no peg to hang one's favorite image. One of the great catastrophes expressed very adequately in world art is this image of ourselves as some kind of external skin, as some kind of bag of circumstance that really has nothing. On the back wall of the Sistine Chapel is the greater mural, not the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, not the creation and all of its ramifications that's usually talked the back wall is Judgment Day. Yom Yahweh. And in the very center of the composition of Michelangelo's Judgment Day is God holding forth his hand, not to touch man to create, but in his hand is this pelt of someone who has been sucked completely out and only the exterior pelt of the man is being held up by God. And when one looks closely, it is Michelangelo himself at age 80-something. He put himself at the very center of Judgment Day, not Pope Sixtus, not some mythological figure, but himself. But just the pelt. What was left? when the real Michelangelo left for the divine realm. Yes, it always happens. The lights go out. So this quality we want to now appreciate, this quality which we observed this morning, the divine darkness, which we talked a little bit about, that the author of the anonymous cloud of unknowing some 700 years ago, 600 plus years ago, wrote in the supposed mode of a Middle Age, Middle English, Mid-England country parson giving advice. One of his other uh, books that survived is called A Letter of Private Direction, Privy Direction meaning good advice written out to a friend, and that's all it is. Why? Why the harmless quality of disguise? Because one needs to protect high wisdom. Because the essential truth of high wisdom is that it negates authority. <laughs> it shorts out power of this world. It doesn't matter how big your organization is. It doesn't matter how long it's run, how much you can bring to bear in a lawsuit. <laughs> it's all extraneous. So that the quality here of high wisdom is that it must always be protected. It's always a secret. In our time, ignorance is uh, so rampant that one doesn't need to have negotiations and tests and so forth. One just simply has to speak truthfully in a quiet way without fame. Uh, and uh, only a few people will ever find it anyway. You don't need elaborate uh, protections. There are ages when you do. In the cloud of unknowing, based upon the mystical theology of Dionysius the Areopagite, living some... 800 years before him. In that mystical theology, we saw that it consists of five parts, five chapters, five simple statements. And in those five statements of the mystical theology, one came to understand that the very first one is the question, what is the divine darkness? because the cloud of unknowing will be someone who is enveloped in this divine darkness. And one of the qualities is that the 
beginner always has a peculiar beginner's quality. Here's the quotation from The Cloud of Unknowing near the end of it. Beginners cannot think unless they read or hear first. Beginners cannot think. In other words, the symbolic function doesn't even operate, doesn't even come into play unless they can read or hear first. That is to say, there must be a function of internalizing the experience of language and reading or hearing are those two function modes. Now generally, in long monastic centuries of a millennium of ignorance and darkness, hearing was the function that was favored over reading. Yes, people read, but they read excerpts. If you ever look at a little breviary or the sentences of, uh, of uh, um, Isidore of Seville or so forth, all learning was condensed to little quotations. So you got a fat book of little quotations so that everything, everything was snipped. Nothing was presented in its wholeness so that what you got were little language pills and no real food. And so people couldn't read, but they could hear. And so at all meal times in the monastic traditions, whether, whether it's Benedictine or whatever it is, you were read to, someone read, someone seated themselves in a little pulpit and read while you ate in silence one could still hear, because that hearing function was essential to the maintenance of the culture. A culture must have the ear in order to survive. The mind needs to read in order to survive. What does Job say? I had heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now my mind saith thee. So beginners cannot think unless they read or hear first, and they cannot pray without prior thinking. <laughs> if one has not come into the ability to have thought, one cannot pray. Now why would a seemingly innocent English parson say this? Let's talk for a second using just a simple technique that Jung would use, and it wasn't Jung's technique, actually the person who originated it was uh, Schiller. The four functions, sensation, feeling, thinking, intuition. In order for prayer to be effective, it has to come from the center. It has to take all four functions in balance, and if you haven't developed thought, you're missing a function. And if thought is not there as a function, well, it is there. It's just atrophied. It hasn't worked. And if one of the functions is atrophied, the other function is going to be inflated. And the other function from thinking is feeling. So feeling is inflated. So one is not only ignorant in the sense of not being able to think, one is inflated and feeling too much. But it isn't feeling that's real. It's called overzealous piousness. In fact, zealots one of the great uh, parties that were uh, uh, anxious to uh, uh, crucify Jesus were, uh, were zealots. Iscariot was a, a zealot. The man who assassinated Gandhi was a zealot. <coughs> it's not that you're wrong, it's that you're not right enough. That's the worst kind of enemy. Because in a way, it's always after more. The ultimate of that is for the revolutionary to commit suicide because uh, not even he is, is rabid enough for it. The Soviet Union is a perfect example of a culture which committed suicide out of this kind of ravenous stupidity. The Cloud of Unknowing author says, beginners cannot think unless they can read or hear first, and they cannot pray without prior 
thinking. But in practice, contemplatives, meditation is instantaneous. Now he talks about earlier in the work, he comes to say that there are, there are classically two kinds of lives, the active life and the contemplative life. These are taken from Philo of Alexandria, a document uh, written about 25 AD in Alexandria and not read for hundreds of years. Not read in the Jewish tradition, not read in the Christian tradition. Long time, just simply wasn't read. The cloud of unknowing author, though, has read Plotinus. He has read Dionysius the Areopagite. He has read Philo. And we find the evidence because he begins right away with that most beautiful of presentation of Philo, who was a very accurate thinker. Philo says that the active life always has a pair of levels that are operative. And for convenience sake, one says higher or lower. Higher or lower. But because of the deep nature of paredness in the Tao Te Ching, Lao Tzu says, of all the things that are manifest, paredness is the deepest of all that the pair occurs as a further pair. For instance, in, in the Tao, one can say that the wholeness is the Tai Chi, and the first pair is yin and yang, but yin and yang also have a pair. They are paired. Here in the active life, the first paredness is higher and lower, but the lower has a higher and lower, and the higher has a higher and lower. Now notice that if you put this in a schemata, in a cardinal series, one has one, two, four, one, two, two square. And if you carried the one, the two, the two to the second power, one further, two to the third power, you would get an eight. And this is the way that progression goes, that sacred quaternary is zero, which you cannot count. Then there's one, then there's two, then there's two squared, which is four, then there's two cubed, which is eight. So that one, two, four, eight occur, but the zero, which does not occur, has to be taken into account. And so you have a five phase cycle of completeness and perfection. That's how it worked. The cloud of unknowing, man, says that the active life has a higher and a lower, and each of the higher and lower has a higher and lower. But the contemplative life has no differentiation whatsoever. It has eternity. So that if you put together the four qualities of the active life, a lower which is higher and lower, and a higher which is higher and lower, and then the fifth, the contemplative life, then you have that five quality of the mystical theology of Dionysius the Areopagite. So now we have a typology. So at the very beginning of the cloud of unknowing, we have a typology, a five-part typology. The first part or if you want to count the other way, the fifth part being the contemplative life, which deals with eternity, which deals with a meditative instantaneousness, which needs no discursive elaboration whatsoever. But the others, the active life, all four of those are capable of discursive characterization and that progressively, as one gets deeper into them, one comes to use symbols more and more. So that in the lower act of life, the very lowest is just a simple meditation, an awareness, a sympathetic understanding. The second level, the higher of the lower, he says, is there in mercy in acts of charity. So there's a kind of a sympathetic 
awareness initially. And that develops, that deepens into acts of charity, mercy. And that itself deepens into a third stage, a third level, which is the beginning of the higher. It's the lower of the higher. And that lower of the higher is not sympathetic understanding, but sympathy. The thing itself. And instead of just meditation, spiritual meditation. What does he mean by spiritual meditation? It means that one keeps uh, present the entire scope of the gestalt, including the background. A meditation that only keeps track of forms is very low grade. All the figures of, of um, the realized East and West always have these thought bubbles around their head. That's keeping the gestalt of the awareness of context and background present as well as whatever forms. If you're still meditating on forms, you're still in great scope. It's all right. Stay there until you learn. So the first stage is just simply meditation, is simply sympathetic awareness. That deepens into mercy, into acts of charity. Charity itself has a, has a way of sliding out of this second level. In Maimonides, the highest charity is that no one knows who gave and no one knows who received. The very first paramita in the Mahayana is dana, giving. Why? Because dana deepens into prajna. That kind of just giving deepens into wisdom, all by itself. It's deeper, more profound quality. It's like true charity, the Maimonides charity, begins with that givingness, but that givingness is like a little flow of drops of water that become the ocean. They're very capable because they go there directly, as long as one doesn't become clever. So we have three levels. We have sympathetic, we have mercy, then we have sympathy, the real thing spiritual meditation, a knowing. But then the fourth level, the higher of the highest, is the cloud of unknowing. Now, if you didn't begin with that high Maimonidean charity, no one knows who gave, no one knows who received, the giving happened. If you didn't begin with that, the integration would not be able to achieve the cloud of unknowing. If you kept a secret ledger, oh, I gave so-and-so 45 years ago, and that son of a bitch is never thankful. <laughs> it's that quality which is the little hook, the little burr. That resistance alone is enough to keep one from entering the cloud of unknowing. So notice that, like in chaos theory, the beginning is the most delicate of all things. Remember, if you've been looking at the films in the course in Dune, the very beginning of it, the beginning is the most delicate of all occurrences. The cloud of unknowing, caught up in, he says, caught up in darkness, caught up in the divine darkness. What if we looked at Dionysius the Areopagite? How does it read? What is the divine darkness? In tr English translation here, leads us up beyond unknowing and light, up to the farthest, highest peak of mystic scripture, where the mysteries of God's word lie simple, absolute, unchangeable, in the brilliant darkness of a hidden silence. Amid the deepest shadow, they pour overwhelming light on what is most manifest, Amid the holy unsensed and unseen, they completely fill our sightless minds with treasures beyond all beauty. One of the translations made in the Renaissance, Ficino's translation, 
used in Latin phrases that would literally translate that if one could look into God's universe deep enough, one would find whirling, twirling light spirals in the midst of the darkness. And of course, it's a perfect uh, uh, description of what would find what one would find with like uh, large telescopes looking into deep space beyond our galaxy at intergalactic space where galaxies very much look like those whirling dervish whirlpools of light that Dionysius the Areopagite saw in his mind very clearly 1,500 years ago. It's like Roger Bacon drawing in the margins of his secret manuscripts while he was in prison from the church for many, many years. And he wrote upside down and backwards. And when he was, uh, it was the same technique that Leonardo used. And in the margins, he drew the sperm and the ovum and all other kinds of microscopic things that it was impossible for anyone in the 1200s to have ever seen, but he saw it in his mind. Because the resolving power of the mind, we've talked about this before, is extremely accurate. The condition is always in the inability to express it. And the reason why differentiation has to happen is that one has to have a differential language capable of expression on a scale of subtlety and completeness in order to be able to not only say, but be. And the person is at the prismatic center of that whole differential spectrum. The person is the prism by which the whole differential energy is able to take out of the divine darkness of realization the spectrum that eventually becomes the cosmos. The pure person makes the cosmos possible if there were no pure person anywhere in creation, there would be no cosmos. The fact that one can see a cosmos is clear evidence that there are at least one and most certainly endless numbers of achieved uh, persons. The fact that the cosmos exists at all is, uh, is the proof of the, uh, the differential achievement. So we don't have to worry. Uh, the road is not only uh, paved all the way, it isn't paved with good intentions, but it's paved with the invitation for you to just go ahead, even though you can't see it. It's most certainly uh, going to be there. The cloud of unknowing author says it's impossible from the initial standpoint. It's impossible to practice the higher activity life part without temporarily ceasing to practice the lower active life part. In other words, you cannot get to the next stage until you cease to practice the stage that you were at. So not only is there a culmination of zero, the integral process leads completely back to something that functions as zero. It's called infinity. In any logical statement, infinity and zero can function interchangeably. It's one of the proofs of the structure of the mind. That still applies to every transition in that phase process. Now, in the act of life, there were four processes, so there are four intervals in the ecology of integration four places where one has to cease doing what one was doing in order to be able then to practice something new. It's as simple as that. You can't do something new until you let go of the old. It's like this whole involvement is so complicated that time forms were given this name. The ancient uh, name for that time form was the cycle of the phoenix. The phoenix can only be reborn 
from the fiery ash end of its previous existence. It, ha it cannot be reborn and maintain its fine plumage. It has to burn up. It has to go into ashes because the new phoenix comes out of the ashes of the old. It means that the next phase cannot begin until that previous phase is just ash. The whole alchemical process was in the proof by the process of cupellation that all the dross will burn away, leaving the gold there. In cupellation, the crucible itself is of a fine alabaster that absolve, uh, uh, that absorbs and absorbs the dissolved non-gold into itself. So if there's a little button of gold, very few people have ever seen that, a little button of gold, molten gold, at the bottom of the crucible. But the spiritual understanding for us is that the button of gold is not a thing. It's the presence of God, which is nothing of this world. And so if there's anything of us left over, we have cheated. The sarcophagus must be empty. That's the sign of royalty. The tomb has to be empty. If there's anything left in the tomb, that's it. For Michelangelo, it was simply the pelt left over. A pelt that was, was pushed by several popes into doing too much labor and for 80-some years just completely zonked himself out. Left a pelt. Kazanzaki's uh, taking Bergson and Nietzsche to an ultimate synthesis says in his great book on spiritual exercises at the very end, he says, Blessed be those who know this, and blessed be those who know that. And at the very end, he says, thrice blessed be those for whom all of this does not exist. It has to be empty. It has to be over, finito, because a beginning is a very delicate, precious thing. It has to come out of the only context that is universally eternal not creation from nothing, not creatio ex nihilo, but Plotinus uses the term at emanation, the principle of the soliton, the way in which a reality occurs. The oak is in the seed. All you need is the seed and the right ground. The oak is there. You cannot see it. So he says it is impossible from our point of view to practice any next stage until we cease to practice the previous stage, which means that in a transition, in a transformation like that, there's always a period where one has to let one's expertise rest. You can't use it. The ego will not do this. It's my expertise. I've worked hard to get this. You have to give it up. We talked once uh, months ago about uh, Leo Tolstoy's beautiful little short story, The Death of Ivan Illich, where the powerful old judge die, realizes that he's contained more and more. He cannot, he's too sick, he can't leave the house. Finally, he can't leave his bedroom. Finally, he's confined to his bed. Finally, he's confined to, confined to his body, and then the image of the black hole that he's about to fall into comes in. And he's fearful, and he's fearful, and he's fearful, till the little grandson comes in, lovingly to look at his grandpa who's dying. And out of love for the little grandson, he experiences the relinquishing of the fear because the final stage of integration is acceptance. And immediately upon acceptance is absorption. Where do we get absorbed to? Nothing? Eternity. Why? Universal law, Dharma, is what happens. 
It's a openness which is fertile. Because back out of that comes not only everything, but even a cosmos that contains the ability to integrate back to nothing. So that the author of The Cloud of Unknowing about Chaucer's time says, the unguarded mind is always moving tangentially. <laughs> it never penetrates, it never gets anywhere, it never is anywhere, it's always moving tangentially. Unconscious thoughts mislead. If bare thought of any content is experienced, rises unbidden of its own nature. There's an elevation. There's a, an inspiration. And so he says, if this is true of just any thought, how much more will be those delicate, sustained thoughts of wholeness, completeness, and perfection? Then he goes in to outlining what had been a bug list in the medieval computer brain. <laughs> the seven deadly sins. Wrath, envy, sloth, pride, avarice, gluttony, lust. He says of all these, and notice the, uh, the consummate wisdom, he says all of these are a typology. They are memory image responses. They themselves are nothing. But the memory image response they cue are for us dynamically infectious. And that's why we have to deal with them in a way to bring them to an absorption where they do not function again. And the memory freed from those image preoccupations comes to itself. It wakes up. This stage, he says, this occurrence, this experience is humility. Humility. He says, of all the contemplatives, humility comes across symbolically most in, he uses the term Mary. In the high wisdom tradition, it refers to Magdalene, not to his mother. He says, unless one is able to let that go, one becomes subject to a spiritual dodge. Spiritual dodge is a, a con game, a self-con game. Even at that refined high level, there's one more thing to do, and that is to stop doing. That reading, thinking, praying in these, the eye of the soul is reason. <laughs> but conscious, Conscience is your spiritual face. You have to stop seeing with the eye, and you have to let the whole face be there. Yes, reason is powerful. The function is uh, indispensable, but it's not the face. It's only the eye. And when the face is there, it's like the ancient Jewish understanding that only the community is able to show the face of God. No man has seen his face. It's that, not that he's a piker, he's not going to show his face. It's that no man is able to see that face. It's a transcendent quality. It's a gestalt beyond us. And this is where he then says, one of the concluding sentences, one of the most profound of all the wisdom teachings in this world. Beginners cannot think unless they read or hear first. And they cannot pray without prior thinking. But practice contemplatives have sudden meditation and eternity occurs. Here. Present. Not somewhere else. Not some other time. And so the cloud of unknowing is the work that we've used 
And as I said last week, uh, if you'll take the four lectures on the four intervals and you pair them up and make a pair of those pairs and just take those four lectures together, they're the ground index by which the whole other movement of all of the 48 other lectures held in like pairs and relationships can be slowly rotated. And you can bring out of those 52 tapes, like a deck of cards, you can bring out anything that you would like to know concerning the integration process. But nowhere in that entire ecology is there anything that's applicable to the differential process. The differential energy mode is completely different, and that's why our education needs a second year. The ancient form was that one begins with a, an eternal pause, and the movement clockwise comes around, and what it meets is not the beginning point, but it meets that Euclidean point of no dimension. It meets that beginning pause, that eternal pause. And so because it cannot complete that clockwise circumambulation, there is nothing there to occupy. It changes in an entiodromia to its opposite. And what was a clockwise motion now turns around. The Greek word for that turning around within one's mind was called in a metanoia. One turns around and one comes all the way back counterclockwise the other way. All the way back to the original eternal pause. The form was used in Pindar's spiritual poetry. It was used in Greek tragedy, strophe, anti-strophe, and stand. And it is the form of sacred dance, the chorea. It's one of the most permanent forms in human experience. Because coming back a third time, one then gets it. That you began from a zero eternity. Midpoint, you rediscovered it, and you came back at the end. And if the beginning, middle, and the end are constant like that, then that cardinal linearity that ran its way changes instantly into something that looks like an infinity sign, the context of which is the beginning, middle, and end as the context. The beginning pause, the middle pause, and the end pause, all three together coalesce and become the formless background for the form that was achieved. At that moment, both are real, equally, paired, very firm anchored, trustworthy, exact. Now that concludes the first year, and this is a very peculiar year because there is another week in this year. And so before we start differentiation, we have a very special occurrence next Saturday. So I'll present a very special kind of a lecture. I will talk about the way in which this education actually works in more detail and some of its history so that you can appreciate that. Nothing will be lost, but we don't want to begin our differential function prematurely. Please note the five self-assignments on Jung's alchemical studies. Sign yourself up for one of the five. Go and find that damn book. Go and get a copy. And uh, begin with that. And then in two weeks, when it comes to begin with the Poimandres and with Zarathustra, I'll provide uh, the necessary materials so that you can uh, begin that way. But you want to have a lead time of at least three or four months with the alchemical studies and the art of memory. Because when we get there, the differential process is completely different from the integral process. And it'll take a little while to realize that this is a different way of functioning. Because now, instead of nature being part of what we always have to compute into what we're doing, now it is displaced by consciousness. And it is consciousness that is very much 
in natural terms, a trickster, very slippery character, quicksilver, very difficult to work with. So that in alchemical studies, one of the most uh, perspicacious of all of Jung's writings is uh, called the spirit Mercurius. And when we talk in just normal English, when we say that somebody is mercurial, it means that they shoot up off the graph because the spirit Mercurius is capable of instant asymptotic exiting. Now you see it, now you don't, but on an even more profounder level. Now you see it, now you don't see it all. That is upsetting if you keep the ego. So one has to learn to let it stay in the closet. Otherwise, you have to go through what Michelangelo went through. That's not very nice. Okay. I'll make tapes of today's lecture.